Hi everyone, Gideon Cordova here to deliver the Council Roundup for Monday the 19th of September. We've just come back from the Council meeting. What's the Council Roundup? Well, this is my opportunity to explain to you what I thought were the highlights of tonight's meeting. So not speaking on behalf of Council, but you can always follow along with the Council meetings by jumping onto the Kingborough Council YouTube channel. All those meetings are live streamed and they're also stored there on the YouTube channel. Also jump onto the Kingborough Council website. You can download the agenda and in time the meeting minutes from tonight's meeting as well. They'll be up in the next few days. And tonight, the first thing that I did was I asked a question without notice about the climate change plan that Kingborough has adopted. And this was with respect to the audit panel meeting minutes. Uh, basically, there's a scoping document that's been done regarding the climate change plan. And essentially, the thrust of my question is that it's very important that we actually adequately resource with the appropriate financial investment to make sure the climate change plan actually takes place. We know how important climate action is to all of our communities, and we know that there's a lot of things that we can do. For example, we've already switched all of the uh, street lights to LEDs. This was a huge cost saving, and also it's obviously um, a more renewable way of doing things, but also putting solar panels on civic buildings, put them on the civic centre, that's already paid for itself, um, and also putting uh, solar panels on the Kingborough Sports Prefix precinct on the uh, on the rooftops there but we still know that 93 percent of all of our emissions as a council are coming from waste to landfill so reducing waste is really a big piece of the puzzle and in order to implement our climate change plan this is adaptation plans for areas that are low lying whether it's kingston beach or snug we're going to have to actually adequately resource those so that was the thrust of that question the second question that i asked related to offshore salmon farms and the impact that they're having on some of the communities in Kingborough. So my first question was, has Kingborough Council run any community consultation with local residents who live within earshot of, of salmon farm operations, including those who can see and hear well boat operations? Um, have we ever run a community consultation to find out what the community thinks about that issue? The second question was, has Kingborough Council investigated the opportunity to apply seabed rates to offshore salmon producers operating in Kingborough's waters and waters adjacent to the municipality? This is the notion that just like any other commercial enterprise that's operating and that has property in Kingborough, they have to pay commercial rates. And that essentially is just like, just like in any commercial situation, you pay your fair share back to the community that supports you. And that's a really good way of making sure that uh, you can run sustainable enterprises in the long term is when you support the community that you operate within. And so this is the idea that seabed rates should be charged to offshore salmon producers in order to, I guess, make them pay their fair share. That Let's be frank, making a lot of money um, owned by multinational corporations. And it's probably important that they start paying back their fair share into these communities. Um, the, the third question was really around the notion of environmental harm and also noise and light pollution, some of the complaints that I'm hearing about marine debris as well. So the third question was, will council consider collaborating with other locally affected councils like Huon Valley, like Tasman councils, uh, to create a working group on salmon farms that can liaise with community stakeholder organisations, local community groups to address some of those community concerns that are being raised by our constituents in relation to offshore salmon farms. That's the environmental harm, marine debris, noise and light pollution. The idea here is that a lot of these community organisations, they are the ones who, in addition to when individuals make complaints about the impact that offshore salmon farming has had, they'll make those complaints to the salmon producers, they'll make those complaints to the environmental, to the EPA, and they'll also make those complaints occasionally to council. But really, these community groups are the, the repository of a lot of that local knowledge and a lot of those local experiences and anecdotes. So I think it would be important to kind of create some kind of a working group so that we can get together, put our heads together and start to really be, a, um, I guess, a, a vocal force in in dealing with what is a, is a very significant issue for a lot of people in Kingborough. So then we moved on to, as a planning authority, then we uh, dealt with uh, an issue to do with Margate and um, a, a development application proposal there. You can watch along the YouTube video to see all about that. But I took that opportunity to also talk about the, the changing face of Margate and the fact that really a lot of investment recently has gone into our town centres, particularly in the Kingston CBD, and also now we really need to start thinking in terms of master planning to make sure that Margate and the channel are actually um, part of our core focus, that we have some strategic overview about what we're doing in those areas. And I think really a street tree strategy would would be a, an enormous contribution to, to that by having some, uh, I guess, some plan for how these 
uh, towns grow into the future and to make sure that they still have urban canopy coverage and they still have natural vegetation and they still look and feel like the wonderful places that they are, but that they grow in a sustainable way um, by still keeping bringing nature into the centre and and keeping nature uh, alongside our lives. That's good for our health and well-being. So after we dealt with that, we then uh, looked at the financial report for August. Uh, we then looked at the Spring Farm play space. And basically, there's been a community consultation that's um, been very well received. I think more than 200 and something people took part in that, the majority of whom live in the area. So that was really good to see. And basically, there was a keep it simple approach that was the, the name of the game on, in this particular consultation. That was the feedback that a lot of people were giving. Traditional play equipment, a mix of concrete and gravel paths. There were suggestions, for example, to have bike tracks, exercise equipment, outdoor gym for adults. Um, all of those would be welcomed as well. But we, I guess we're looking at the, um, there's about $200,000 to spend. And so we were looking at what's really possible in a pocket park kind of size. Um, other notable mentions were for a netball or basketball court and toilet or parent space. Um, but again, there was this discussion around the size of the park, the amount of money that's available to invest in that. And I welcomed the concept by one respondent for interpretive signage relating to native Tasmanian food plants. I thought that was a really good idea and acknowledging First Nations owners as well. I used this conversation as a springboard to talk about a holistic approach to building community because ultimately that's what we're doing when we put in a park when we put in a play space yes it's good for young people yes it's good for parents but it's also about building community and so in order to achieve that you also need to talk about active transport linkages pedestrian linkages you need to talk about lighting and safe places um, passive surveillance you also need to talk about public transport having free safe reliable and frequent public transport is absolutely a game changer so we know that in areas like Spring Farm, which is already, what, three years old, it still takes 25 minutes to, to walk to a, a nearby bus stop in Mertonvale. So we need to really make sure that the state government is on board with this idea of making public transport via Metro free and also more frequent and, and, and more reliable. After we dealt with that, we also discussed the, the naming of a road in Blackman's Bay. So this is a new road and it's going to be called Nano Drive. This is a fitting tribute to Nano Nagel, born 1718, uh, died 1784, who was known in her native Ireland and around the world for her help uh, for working with the poor and for delivering education to those to whom it was prohibited. In the year 2000, Nagel was voted Irish Woman of the Millennium, quote, in recognition of her importance as a pioneer of female education in Ireland. And in a 2005 radio poll, she was voted Ireland's greatest woman ever. So you might ask the question, why are we calling this particular road Nano Drive after Nano Nagel? Well, that is the, the area where the Presentation Sisters um, uh, had had their had their buildings and um, they first came out, the Presentation Sisters first came out from Ireland to Tasmania in 1866 and for whom this area of Blackman's Bay was very important. And so there's this kind of through line linkage there in the naming of this new road. Next, we dealt with the development services quarterly report and there were a couple of questions that I asked about the Kingston Park 50 apartment development that's currently going through a tribunal appeal so a lot of information there you can jump on the YouTube channel to watch all the discussion and see the answers to a lot of those questions and you can also download the public agenda and the meeting minutes when they come out in due course that's all for the Council Roundup for this evening, this Monday, the 19th of September. Thanks for joining me. As ever, always get in touch if I can be of assistance. Thanks for watching this Council Roundup, and I'll see you at the next Council Roundup. Good night. Authorised by G Cordova, Tasmanian Greens, Hobart.